Um, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone out there, all of our friends in the film roundtable realm. Um, this is episode number 10, uh, for those of you that are keeping count. And as always, uh, please feel free, if there's one of the episodes you want to go back and check out, uh, go to filmroundtable.org and check it out in our vault. That's where you're going to find all of uh, the back episodes. And uh, today we've got a very special group with us here. Um, we have with us DP director Rachel Morrison. Um, you know, she, she hates that. She, she doesn't like that type of introduction, but it's, it, it, it's true. Everyone, you're going to have to get used it, to it, Rachel. Or is it um, director DP? Which one's first? Definitely DP, DP first. <laughs> Always DP first. We love your Always. show. Um, we also have with us Natasha Breyer, DP Natasha Breyer. And we have Greg Frazier as well, uh, coming to us from London. So that's why we're, we have two people on the West Coast and, two, and Greg coming to us from London. Um, we want to give you guys a little virtual applause since uh, we know that there's people out there clapping for you guys, but you can't hear it. Um, <laughs> now, always, everyone, before uh, we begin, uh, for those of you that follow us, uh, we always, because these conversations all started as we've all come together under the COVID lockdown umbrella, even though some of us are still going back to work, it's still very important to uh, discuss uh, that aspect of it. So as everyone knows, we discussed the numbers. So we're currently at 750,000 worldwide deaths since this lockdown began. And of those 166,000 are in the United States alone. Um, and also the other thing we also like to discuss is the fact that we know that there's a lot of still social unrest going on in countries around the world, um, in cities around the world and in major cities in the United States. So we'd like to honor all of our black and brown brothers and sisters, as well as our first nation brothers and sisters whose lives have been taken by the hands of police brutality and any and all other actless, uh, senseless acts of violence here and around the world. So if everyone of you can just join us, please, let's just have a virtual moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. That means a lot to us here. And for a lot of the people that follow us, they know that that's something that is very important for us. Um, so uh, today, uh, we're going to get into a little bit of a deep dive with these three talented filmmakers uh, about certain things that are kind of becoming more relevant in a lot of our minds now. And this is the work-life balance, um, which maybe wasn't very important to a lot of us before the lockdown happened. Uh, it probably was, but in the back of our minds. And, and since the lockdown has happened and we're all starting to go back to work, we've kind of, a lot of us have been operating with a little bit of a different sensibility in terms of, you know, hey, how do we want to go back to work? Or maybe what is it that we have learned? Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about before is that as a, our industry as a whole, it hasn't been since 1918, during the last pandemic, um, iced our whole industry for almost a year as it's done now. And not only that, it also created the studio system because all of the movie theaters kind of went out of business and then they got bought up by the studio systems, by the studios at the time. And that was the birth of the studio system as we know it. So these cyclical events that occur in our business force change upon us, uh, you know, whether we like it or not. And a lot of us now are in a position uh, to, you know, maybe seek something different, something better. And I know all three of you were in maybe some different stages of uh, preparing projects um, before this lockdown occurred. Um, and I'm curious, Rachel, with you first, like, you know, as your, your creative energy and your creative force, as you were taken away from the project that you were prepping, and for those that don't know, it was Rachel's directorial debut. She was on the cusp of starting the shoot. Um, what were some of the things that you learned or went through your mind um, as, you know, as you're forced to be home initially? We'd actually started shooting, uh, which is crazy. We were two days in out of 41. Um, 
And, you know, one of the things for me, first and foremost, to reckon with was how to get back to my family, because my, my family had come for some of prep and they had gone home. So when this all went down, you know, initially it was actually Universal sort of tasked us, we were in Toronto, and so they tasked us to, to make the determination about, you know, whether to shut down, when to shut down, all of that, um, you know, and basically said they would support us, but because they weren't on the ground in Toronto, they had no way to gauge. And for me, it just came down to, it became very clear that we weren't going to be able to get through the movie. And what I didn't want to happen was to push it so far that I somehow got shut out away from my family. And I think that with a lot of people who are shooting abroad, you know, their biggest concern was how do I get home to the people that I love? Um, you know, so that, so that was certainly like first and foremost. And now I think what we're seeing, and this is where it gets really tricky, is for those of us who are talking about going back, there are a lot of places that are, will issue business permits internationally, will issue business permits for for the DP or for the people who are on the set, but they won't actually let your family come with you. Um, so that's, you know, that's a whole new world order that I don't know what that's gonna look like. Um, you know, for me, in life, I've always been an advocate of, of trying to find ways to, you know, incorporate family and, and have my family come with me to set. So I don't know. Anyway, I'm rambling. I, I heard about a production going in Hungary soon that, that they've not allowed anybody else with. So no, obviously no family, no friends, no entourage, no assistants. Like, but it's a big show. So I think it's a Nick Cage film. So you're right. They're doing that. They're, they're forcing people to travel without family and stuff, which is almost torturous really isn't it like it's almost not well yeah i mean right. one of my one of my dear friends literally had to turn down two jobs because he wasn't allowed to bring his family on either of them one was in australia and one was in 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 canada and so he's wow. not working rather than leave his family behind um who's but, stopping that is straight is it is the other country stopping it or is the studio yeah. stopping it no I think countries aren't doing reason I think it's the countries yeah i think you can wow. only get in on a on a work on a work visa that, that that's a difficult thing. I mean, once they start to tell us that our significant others or our families can't, you know, come with us, I mean, that becomes, you know, a whole nother layer of, you know, trying to understand for all of us going back now. I mean, obviously there's safety concerns, but there's also, you know, as, as we've all learned, you know, from being home or not working as much um, in this time period, how some of those small things, how important they are and how much we've missed those things. You know, and I know personally for myself, I've been on the road so much of the last five years, you know, I've barely seen my teenage children, you know, you know, grow up. I just visit from time to time, you know, so, you know, I mean, I'm curious, I mean, Greg, from your standpoint, because you're actually back now prepping overseas, right? Are, are you allowed to have um, any of your family come with you over there where you are in London? Uh, yeah, there, there hasn't been a restriction. I mean, we've got my wife's, uh, it's a long story. I don't want to go too deeply into it, but we managed to, she got a visa for her business and stuff. So my, my two of my children were born here through films, ironically, because I was here on two films. So they've got the right to be here, um, which helps. So the other, my wife, yeah, anyway, it's a long story, but yes, they can. They can be here, which is, I must say though, but I, but Rach, I agree. Like there was, there was a period of time where if that couldn't happen, well, then I wouldn't be here. You know, if they couldn't travel, I wouldn't travel. Like it starts to become, um, you know, when we shut down, it was, there was that whole thing. Luckily my family were with me, but there, every, all the Americans that were here and all the people from overseas, they, they literally left in the dead of night. I mean, it was like the fall of Saigon. Like that was people I, that was me too. I mean, I just got my, all my things shipped back to me from the office, you know, I think last week because we left. Wow. I mean, I we made the decision at 2 p.m. on Friday and I was on a flight at six. Natasha, where were you? Were you in LA? Yeah, I was in LA. I was preparing a movie here. Um, so uh, it was a lot simpler, you know, for me, I just stayed here. And now we're resuming prep also here. So I don't have to deal with all these issues of traveling and yeah. Know where you can can take my boyfriend or not so mm -hmm. it's it's a lot easier you know it's a lot easier but i'm but still don't know exactly if we're gonna have to like how we're gonna do it here if we're gonna quarantine uh, i know that they're gonna test us like three times a week but uh it's not very clear yet what's gonna happen in terms of like your normal life on the weekends and things like that 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of these things were an issue pre-COVID, you know, in terms of in terms of family and you is you take your kids out of school and you know I mean basically since our industry has started to go where the tax incentives are you know I mean I think we're all I don't it seems like we're all of a generation that that didn't know the studio life where you got to you know work at Paramount for 20 years in a row and raise your kids in Los Angeles totally. so buy, buy, buy a house in Studio City and live yeah. right next to the studios yeah yeah so this decision, I feel like we're not new to the decision. Now it's just crazy in, in the sense of like, it, it may be three months where you don't see your family as opposed to coming and going or figuring out what you do or whether they move and set up shop yeah. in Atlanta or whatever. Particularly when there's a quarantine, because like Chicago right now, I think there's a quarantine. So if your family wants to visit you, let's say you're shooting in New Zealand or Australia and you can go there for to visit, you're quarantining for two weeks before you can get out and see it. So you're sitting in a hotel room. So you're asking your family to sit in a hotel room for two weeks just to see you and for an hour a day at the end of a day, which is, you know, that's always a consideration, but not the quarantine part. It's like, do you ask your family, do you ask your, your partner, your, your family, relatives, whatever to, to come and visit so they can get the last half an hour of your day, the least energetic part of your day. Like, I don't know. It's pretty, it's, it's a it's a it's a debate, isn't it? Because if they're in a place that's not good for them, doesn't work for them, um, then what's the, what's the point? I mean, thankfully, big big cities help though, don't they? Like if you're in sort of smaller regional areas, even though they've got their own charm, it's like do they have their own charm for a two year old? Like does a two year old really want to, you know, explore downtown Pittsburgh? It's it's a valid point, and I'll I'll tell you. From firsthand knowledge, I mean, my kids are now late teenagers and I rarely took them on the road. I mean, they would come and visit, you know, when I was at other places for a week or 10 days. But, you know, and it was more it was very painful on me, to be honest, with you, as I look back upon it, I'm realizing that there was a lot of their growth that I wasn't around for. But I took the, the mindset that it was better maybe for them for me to not take them out of their element and do, as you said, as in our positions, how much time of our quality time can we really give like you know working yeah. as dps or as a first ad it's like we're all in like you know we're not just the 12 hours but the mental space after that i mean that's what this business has done to us in our positions right is like we have to be you know all in five days a week in order to be at the top of our game and that does take a toll on our families even if we are able to bring them or we make the decision not to bring them and our significant others and, you know, whatever our extended mm. family unit is. And this is just how the business has, has been. And, you know, one of the things that we're chit chatting about a little bit before going on here is, you know, coming out of this now, the ability to change that there has been a lot of conversation about controlling the work hours, about trying to stay within the French hour system of working 10 hour days. So a lot of us, have free time after that. And the impetus right now is for health, but there's a lot of people that want that to extend further and start to become a mandate. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I can just speak to that a second, um, you know, just to clarify the health component, you know, what's happening for those who don't know is that, you know, people say that the number one thing we can do to boost our immune system is get enough sleep. So now suddenly in this COVID reality, you know, there are mandates to do 10 hour days, even on commercials, which, you know, are historically very, very long. And it's amazing. It's great. And it's, it's what a lot of people, I think, specifically parents in the industry have been advocating for for a long time. I did it for the first time on Black Panther. You know, Marvel got hip to this, I think, long before any of any of this because you know their their wardrobe and costume and makeup changes are so big that the time that you lose when you stand down for lunch is like yeah. you know the, you gain that just by the way that a 10-hour day works for those who don't know is you do 10 hours straight and you sort of have a rotating crew meal which if you're in the camera department or the first lady you probably never see but everybody else hopefully finds you know a moment to, to eat and it's the difference between, you know, 10 hours of straight time and you really have to hold it to 10 or, you know, on a 12 hour day, you're then adding another hour for lunch. So it's really 13. And then once you're in 13s, yeah. it's like you're doing 14s and it, it, it's a world of difference. Um, and so, you know, on Panther, I know Ryan struggled a little bit at first just because you sacrifice the like 
you know, sitting down at, at lunch and, and, and strategizing over a game plan for the second half of the day. There's sort of no downtime, but it is so worthwhile as a parent, you know, and, I, and I'm sure Ryan now as a parent is going to be so grateful for the 10 hour day, you know, because you, you get to see your kid on one on one end, you know, either morning mm. or night versus on a 13 or 14, you could go an entire Monday through Friday work week and never see a small child. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely something that, you know, we hope sticks, you know, and goes forward. I mean, N Natasha, what's your experience with that? Have you, I mean, obviously in, in, in South America, when you were first coming up, was there, was in terms of the work days, because I've worked a little bit in Argentina and Brazil, you know, where they keep it within the 10 scape. Did you grow up in that system mainly when you're starting out? Well, I started out in England. I went to film school there. And so I grew up, grew up as a cinematographer in England. I, I moved out of Argentina when I was 18. But I, but I did a film in Argentina, which we had the French system. And, and I also worked in France. I, I shot a movie in France with a 10 hour. And it's great. Yeah, I mean, it just makes such a difference, especially as the weeks go by, like, you know, that extra sleep and rest. Um, it's... It's it's, it's 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 very common in the UK. I mean, it's it, that's what we all do. Like it's ten hours, it's the it's a joyous thing. It's uh, as as you just said, guys. Like the you, it's eight to six, which is normal, like bankers' hours. You know, like it's yeah, you've got to do post, of course, and you've got to have meetings about the next day, and you probably do a pre call because of blocking pre call. So you're at seven thirty till six thirty or something. But but in, yeah, by the time you get home, seven thirty, you've got time with your with your partner to at least say hi and to talk about the day and your life doesn't become all about the movie so yeah. it, it is an incredible an incredible thing the problem the reason why it doesn't happen in the us though tell me if i'm wrong about this though doug is it's all the penalties isn't it like it's because the uh, the unions impose penalties on any time after six hours from meal break is that correct it, it is it, so there's a lot of depending upon and you know there's different schools of thought but um it comes close to a wash in terms of the penalties versus the paid hour days. Cause you have to understand there's right. a lot of, you know, especially if you've got a, you know, movie with a very large transportation unit where you're moving around a lot. Like when you have, if you have a sizable shooting crew that's there every day and you're able to idle two hours of pay for everyone, um, you know, it can come close to a wash and be potentially a little bit, you know, more expensive. Um, but if you're able to really stick to it, um, you know, and you do your budgeting that way, um, you're able to figure it out because it's by no means a astronomically more, you know, if you're guaranteeing that you're going to, you know, send everyone home after 10 hours. Got it. Okay. And I, I think that the, like, to go back to the concept at large, you know, the struggle, the work-life balance or lack thereof is the struggle to be, you know, fulfilled on a human level, you know, which actually makes us much better at our jobs. Like, I think all you do is work and you're never, you, you go to a beautiful place, but you never get to see any of it, or you never get to meet any of the people or talk, you know, eating any of the food. Like, how do you even put that back into the work? Which is why, you know, having two hours off in Jordan or in, you know, it, it's so, it actually is gonna infuse, infuse the work and make it better, you know, just for you having, life experience and being able to read a book and then conversely you know I think from a family perspective when we all need a certain amount of fulfillment in our career to make us good parents and good role models you know and I think it's trying to yeah. find and navigate that not just in the 10 hour day of it all but you know in the jobs that we choose and you know occasionally having to sacrifice time with the family but it brings us such great joy that that we're better parents when we come back to our kids and then obviously, you know, I think what, what, what everybody has learned from this time at home is how much joy being a parent brings to, you know, to, to the work that we do, you know? Um, I mean, I think that's something that, that it's easy to lose sight of. Very funny that coming back now, the, the first thing, you know, everyone realizes, cause we, we, we lost a, a, a lovely crew member due to COVID. And so no one takes COVID lightly, but the, the cons general consensus is having come back, everybody feels very fulfilled because they've spent that time with their partners, with their family, with their friends, like, you know, not, not in a sociable environment, but just being what everything that you, you're not, that's not encouraged to be a good 
mother or a good father when you're in the film industry. Not, not that it's not discouraged and no one's standing around going, you shouldn't be a good parent or you shouldn't be a good sibling or you shouldn't be, but it's, it's not encouraged because it doesn't help your career to be a good father. Like it doesn't help my career to be a good father to my children, you know, but having spent the time, the overwhelming reaction for everybody that I've spoken to is like, I loved spending that time with the kids, hated homeschooling, hated, you know, Mm. cleaning the dishes every three hours but loved spending the time with the kids. Well, that's the and thing. Partners. Yeah. I mean, in terms of being home, I mean, that's another thing, you know, that I'm curious about, like, you know, what did, you know, for the most part, I mean, you guys are all creative entities, you know? So it's like, you're all in when you're working on a project. And if the project was being home, like, you know, like Natasha, give me an example creatively during this downtime, because, you know, people are actually peppering me with some questions and asking, like, did any of you do any, like, little shoots at home or do anything creative with your friends, like, in lockdown, anything like that? Natasha, how did you kind of, you know, burn your creative fire in this time? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, um, I, I really took the time for resting and nurturing, you know, everything that you guys were just talking about before. I don't have kids. Um, so I, for me, it wasn't about spending a lot more time with my kids. I mean, I spend a lot of time with my boyfriend, which I usually don't have that time either, but I think there was also, you know, I have a lot of friends that were totally alone, you know, they didn't even have a partner and, and they spend that time with themselves. And I think what I get like a, as the common denominator for everyone is that it was a time of nurturing, you know, like resting and recharging your batteries and nurturing. And you could nurture, you know, on a family level, on a relationship level and on a personal level. And for me, it was like the first month, it was just like sleeping and eating healthy and resting. And I couldn't do anything else. I was just really overwhelmed. Wow. Everything I was the just- The opposite, opposite what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah eating 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 unhealthy and not sleeping <laughs> yeah i mean everyone has their own you know reaction and there was people that couldn't stop doing things that were desperate to just like do something and be, be productive and i was like i'm just like in total shock like I, i'm not gonna ask myself to be productive right now but what i needed at that point because i had been like working for two years almost non-stop i personally needed to just decompress and stop and nurture myself and and it was almost like, you know, when you finish a film shoot and you get like a cold for a few days and yeah. you're like, okay, yeah. we're not like living on adrenaline now. We're just going to take this week to chill out and, and then we get sick and stuff just to rest. For me, it was a bit like that, but it was like a 20 years, <laughs> you know, nonstop. <laughs> and suddenly it was like, okay, we're just going to chill out. And my body was just like sleeping 12, 13 hours every day. Uh, and just resting and then yeah after a month I started to nurture myself with other you know I started to do my yoga practice again and I started to do the Wim Hof method you know with the cold showers and getting in like um, bath yeah. baths full of baths. Yeah. Yeah. Baths. yeah awesome I want to yeah. I want to do that I always wanted to do it I had bought the online workshop like three years ago and I never passed after week one and so I was like okay I'm gonna do it now it was 10 weeks so it was like the whole quarantine, I, I felt like I had this purpose that I was training for something that was strengthening my immune system. And it was really like kind of antidepressant and anti-anxiety was like really good for my mental health. Yeah. And I started to do a lot of that. Like I was just super careful with my diet, doing the yoga, doing the wing hop, reading, like watching some movies, like everything that I you know, didn't have time to do before, you know, going on walks with my boyfriend, like sailing on his boat, like I never have time to go, like just living life. And it's been, you know, I think for me, it's been a lot more useful than being productive doing stuff because I really needed to recharge. And it's what Rachel was saying before that when you go and shoot away and you don't get to experience the place and, and hang out with your new friends, you know, who are the locals. And, and so you don't get time for all that nurturing and you're just like, doing all the time um and and it's uh, you know it, what we do is like a great work but it's it's just we're putting we're just giving out it's energy going out all the time creative energy physical mm -hmm. energy and and it is really important to to take the time to to recharge all of that because that's not only going to inform you 
your work, as Rachel said, is your work is going to be a lot better when you actually have something left inside you to yeah, give and yeah. put into your work. But also, of course, everything else, your physical health, your relationship health and and all of that. So, um, yeah, I think it, I think it was a really important kind of n nurturing time and, and then going inwards. You know, I think also for everyone in a very different way, but I think for everyone it's been like some sort of spiritual experience where we all kind of stopped and had the time to stop and look how we're doing things and, and what do we want to change. So what do you think is going to change now for you? Like, because you've, you've now reset and rebooted, right? So yeah. are you going to slip straight back into the old ways or are you going to carry that on? um no I won't I mean I you know I I had moments in my life where I also like completely run out of energy um and I had to like kind of do this thinking you know before about balance and stopping and nurturing so it, it wasn't like totally new but then you know how it is suddenly you get like a few projects on a row and you blink and it's been two years and you haven't rested and stuff and that kind of yeah happened but not, not in a terrible way like I'm I think I've gotten quite better at the balance in the last few years uh, of my life like to the point that you know sometimes I I did not take movies that were abroad because I didn't want to be you know away from my partner for six months or, or things like that and, and and that has had an effect more in my career than in my personal life but I I, I, I think I've been making already those choices and really trying to to create this balance you know as, as much as possible um the difference now is like that i feel that after these three to four months of rest i feel like i'm not it's it's, it's, it's proving very challenging going now i'm going back in prep now and i've done a few commercials and it's kind of hard for my body to go back to that rhythm it's really interesting uh and i know yeah, that you you You'll get back on the bike though. It won't take long. It's like a week or two and you'll be yeah, well, but I've done, Yeah, I've done a few commercials and now, now I'm in prep for the movie. But in the commercials, I was like, at the end of them, I was like, wow, I didn't used to be <laughs> that tired, you know? But I think there's something in the air also, like everyone is more tired. Everyone has less energy. Yeah. The drama, yeah. of the air, you know, it, now it's a normal thing, but we are in a very particular situation. And I think that emotionally drains a lot of energy out of you um but yeah i mean it's it is hard to go to that rhythm and, and it would be amazing that you know that we can do shorter hours and and also that we can hopefully come back to to a more kind of local system you know where it's a bit more possible to shoot in the in the city where you live instead of being these gypsies all the time going to the yeah wherever there's less tax yeah the thing that was interesting okay. about this time down is you know, usually when we all have time down, right, you're thinking about, well, what's the next thing? Well, wh why, why am I not working now? Other people are working. There's a, a paranoia that settles in about professionally, like your, your, your place, right? But this time, because of how it came about, there was none of that. So it was a much easier way to find an inner peace because everybody was in the same place. So you weren't looking over your shoulder or hearing about someone getting a job you might have wanted because that was all gone. So it's, it's put us in a position to reframe our mind a little bit because yeah. we were able to charge a ba our batteries in a way that we never have before. It definitely, I definitely agree with you about providing inner peace about work for that perspective. <laughs> there was a number of things though that, that I, 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 I wrestled with and that wasn't about spending time with family. It was fantastic. There was the underlying stress of, listen, I mean, those of us that were in LA during that period of time, knew what was going on in, in America during that time with, with the, the protests and, you know, and, and the thought of, you know, if you're, what happens if two parents get ill at the same time, you know, which has happened to a number of my crew, by the way, I found out subsequently, but that great fear that if both parents get ill at the same time and can't look after children and, you know, we've got three children, one that's slightly older. So, yeah, but you know, Rachel, like you've got young kids, like if, you and your partner went down, you know, you, you, you know, the they're not looking after themselves. <laughs> yeah. They're not looking after themselves, are they? No. So there was, to me, to me, even though there was a number of beautiful things about the period of time, there was an underlying 
deep stress that I was under, that my wife was under for those reasons as well. My wife also runs a company that was, you know, having to deal with an economic crisis, but there was a serious underlying stress that went on during that period of time. And also the homeschooling and the, the again, looking after normally, you know, I mean, we're fortunate in that we have some help with our children, with schools, you send the kids to schools for six hours a day. So you have six hours to yourself to, to do what you need. So, I mean, to, to have to take all that on very much was like, a, um, a, like regressing from a societal perspective back into the 1800s of again, homeschooling and, and all those, all those chores that, that you can outsource now to, to, to have more of a fulfilling career. So yeah, I, I agree about some level of, um, of, of, you know, in a security, but also there was a high level of stress there for me. Me, you know, I went from, this is the first project that I've done that my family wasn't going to be there with me for the whole time. So I went from full on directing mode. It was actually like the first time in five years where I haven't, you know, where I was actually, I'd sort of the parenting thing was I was doing from the distance, you know, Greg, I think you've done a bunch of shoots where you were abroad and just fully focused on, on the shoot, but you know, not, you know, obviously you see your family when they come to visit. Um, but I was in it and then overnight, I mean, in that four hour window from shutting down at two to getting on a plane at six, I was full-time mom to two kids who hadn't seen me for a month. So I didn't yeah. even have time to process it. And I think that was actually really traumatic for me. Like, I, mean, I don't know that, having time to process would have made much difference to the trauma. It was traumatic for everybody. You know, our world is never going to be the same again. And then, you know, and then you add George Floyd and everything else to the mix and you just, it's like crippling emotionally, but you know, it's also, it, you're, you're crippled emotionally and you still have to be present as a parent 24 seven, which, you know, I think to a partner too, if you have a boyfriend, you know, you, you can't be, I guess it's, it's different with young kids, you know, and this is something I mean, I think even on a on a pre-COVID film film life, you know, the balance is tricky because it's like for every you know fifty hours you're at work, you come home to a parent who's like, okay, it's your turn now, and and literally you have no me time like that. That doesn't yeah. exist, you know. I think one thing that I've had to wrestle with, um, you know, I'm a big advocate for if you want to have a family. And, and it's not for everybody. And I don't you know, think that everybody need, needs this in their lives, but if you do, you, there's gonna be a sacrifice. And for now it feels like the sacrifice is, is me time. You're either yeah. professionally all in or you're you know, all in as a parent. And you just, I don't even know the meaning of sort of self-care. Um, and that well, didn't really change for COVID because you didn't have help. You, you're just yeah. it's all, it's full on all the time. Which I think is highlighted beautifully by the fact that you're sitting in your own car outside of Starbucks to try and get peace and quiet and no one screaming or opening a door to try and ask you to for lunch or, or something yeah no, it, that's, I told these guys why I'm always in my, in my car on these and it's because I can't I can't get anything done at home I've, I've become very good I've savvy of where I can get free wi-fi and you know this is my home office I I, I I can relate to that highly because I, my home office was the, the whole foods near my house and, you know, I put the seat back and I'd, I'd often get in trouble from the security, but eventually they learned that I was okay. They'd walk past, they wouldn't mark my tire in the wave. <laughs> but it's funny because like, the thing is that when you've got- word from Batman and you're like, this is my <laughs> license to be here. But the, the thing that, the, 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 the thing that actually tipped it over the edge for us was there was a time, you know, when once you ha start having children, all of your own stuff starts getting into lo drawers lower and lower and lower in the in the cabinets, and eventually, when you have a number of children, they go under the house. So, one day, I had nothing in the house. I was under the house looking through my stuff, and I'm hearing screams from above and banging. I'm hearing plates hit the ground, and I found a little bit of solitude in my crawl space under my house, like lying on my stomach, like a snake going through all my old books and boxes and stuff. And I realized that me finding solitude under my house in the crawl space with the spiders, it was time to figure out how to actually balance that. And that was when I then moved to the car 
in the Coldfords car park. Mm-hmm. It was pretty, that was a step up for me. Can you guys get an office room? In the house? <laughs> there are so many rooms in these I American have, houses. I have, I have an office. That was actually one of the things that got done just in time for COVID. I have an office under the house, but I literally hear you know, footsteps and crying and, Scream, and screams. Yeah. And, and also if look, the fact of the matter is if your partner knows you're at home, there's always that like, Hey, can you just help me for one second? Or, Hey, you know, are you, are you busy right now? And it's like, it's not the same as just removing yourself from the equation altogether. Yeah. So I have an office collecting dust cause it's just still not practical. That's, that, that's amazing. It's, you know, all these people out there who follow us and listen in, tuning in to understand that, you know, that some, some, some of the major creative forces in Hollywood are forced to work out of their cars. It's, uh, I think this, this is yeah. a serious learning lesson for all of us. <laughs> and that the working in your car for me was a step up from where it was previously. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's but it's all it's all good though because ultimately like you're doing that because of the choice that you made then to have children in that case or you know so it's all good. And, it's just and I'm frustrating. Just so fortunate to have that choice, you know. I think that's that's right. One of the things that I have learned from you know from being, you know, kind of not by choice but becoming a bit more of a public figure is like how many people didn't felt like they could not make that choice. Like I know so many women who chose not to have kids because they didn't feel like they were able to have both career and, and, and children, um, you know, and probably men too, but, but certainly as mothers, there was sort of a real catch 22 or, you know, people, you, you couldn't, I mean, people had to hide, hide pregnancies, hide, you know, hide family lives to, to, you know, and all of these things. And it's like, I feel so fortunate to, you know, to not have that be the case, but, but the sacrifice comes somewhere. And in my case, it's lack of sleep and lack, lack of self-care, mm-hmm. but the rest is, is great. But, you know? but you're I, right though. Like that, that's always, that's always been really odd to me that something that's so, so natural, although it's something that is a natural thing can be seen as a handicap. So, you know what I mean? Like in, in the process, like someone's pregnant, well, why can't they do the job? I mean, uh, it, it, to me, it's it's it always astounds me why, and but that's just how it's been, right? Not to say yeah. it's good, it's just how it's been. So it's great to see, you know, you guys with a camera on your shoulder and a and a and a pregnant belly to go. You know what? It's it's they're not mutually exclusive. You can do both of them at the same time, and actually, in some ways, you can do a better job because you're seeing the world differently. You know, as a as a as a pregnant woman you're doing the job differently than if you weren't maybe yeah yeah i mean there's a level of subjectivity and experience we bring to everything um but yeah i mean it's still tricky like you know i don't know how long were you away on dune about six to seven months see i don't know that i could ever do that and i you know some of it is is my own you know my own i don't i don't know that i could personally be separated from my family that long but I also, there is, I mean, you know, society is so judgmental still, you know, how, how as a mom, can you leave your kids for seven months, you know, and and that, that I will always have, you know, we will always, you know, I, I, there are many projects that, that would I have loved to shoot, you know, something that was that big and that scopey and, you know, fuck yeah. But is that realistic for me? Who knows, Mm. you know? Um, I mean, it's very much a, um, you know, that it goes back also to how one deals with that as well, because you're, you're right, societal pressures, there are different on males and females. And it's so shitty that that's the case. It's so shitty. Like I, and we, that's changing though. It's changing. I think by our kids' generation, that will be hopefully eradicated. Um, but but it doesn't necessarily change the, the, the mental health issues that go along with being away from the family. I mean, on Zero Dark Thirty, I had a three-month-old that I left for five months. Like, it broke my heart, completely broke my heart to do that. So then over the course of the next eight years, me trying to work out how to deal with those separations, you know, in some films I'd go out every night with crew, get drunk, eat burgers, and be mentally not as fit. And some other 
shows I wouldn't go out, but I'd eat burgers and drink and I'd get fat and like on other shows, like like doing what I did and I was a bit really boring. I kind of, I became like a monk, you know, I went home, I had the same meal every night. I didn't eat unhealthily. I didn't drink or very, very little. I, I mean, I tried not to drink at all. And so you know, the family visited a couple of times, which helped. Um, but it was like focus. So I started to become, try to become like a, like a, like a, like a monk. And it, it was good. It was actually enjoyable because I could focus and I wasn't, um, yeah, but you're right. It sucks. It sucks. It totally sucks. Which is why, for example, this film may have been different had the family not been able to come. Yeah. So, but thankfully we're in a place, I mean, London is also an incredibly place, great place for families to be. So, you know, it, it, that that's a huge bonus. Well, you know what, uh, something I find interesting is because, I mean, we all remember starting out when we were very early in our career. And I think this has started to change, but we often there are so many of, of the elders within the industry you'd look at and they had two or three families. They're on their second or third yeah. family, significant yeah. others, this, that, and the other, because it just, the, the business was so immersive and they weren't trying to protect themselves as we all are with our partners and our family so that it was very easy just to cast aside and be like, okay, that didn't work out. And then you'll find something else. And, you know, it, it's a lot of work that we have to put in it being in this business and trying to hold the fabric of, you know, our loved ones together in all different areas. Yeah. I just remember always being like, oh, I don't want to be like that guy with like three different wives and four or five different kids. He never I'll, I'll yeah. tell you a funny story. When I was at Camera Maj for, uh, I think it was Fruitvale. So it was like 2012, 2013. My wife and I were starting to talk about kids at the time and, you know, and we were working on a relationship, which always, look, I don't know if anybody in this industry, I mean, it is difficult, kids aside, it's like, it's difficult to maintain a relationship. It's so hard to navigate people's, you know, varying levels of, of devotion to their careers and like whether there's competition there and the time that's spent apart and re-entry when you come home after you've been gone for a long time and sort of you've been the boss on set and your you know partner has been the, the boss on home, like all of these things, but so, my wife was like, well, well, show me some examples of DPs who, you know, who figured it out. Like, what's it going to look like? And yeah. I, so everybody else at Camera Maj talking about, you know, the latest cameras and the latest lenses <laughs> and movies. And I'm going up to every DP, like, you know, at a How level that I aspire to and ask them what their family life is like. And literally, this is the depressing part. I had, I didn't, there was not one example that I could come back with. Like, everybody oh. was on third marriage, kids that weren't talking to them, lives they wish they'd lived differently. Now, uh, you know, it's evolved a little. I, th I think Caleb Deschanel has done it really well. He might be the yes. only one that I know, you know, that of, of that generation who, you know, and he only took movies in LA while his kids were growing up and his kids seem to have done, you know, everybody, I mean, I have no idea what goes on behind the scenes. I could be talking completely out of turn, but it seems like he figured it out. But every single other DP I talked to, it was like, it was a horror story, you know? So it's like, it, it's not easy. Nobody, and nobody's no. selling it as easy. And also I think it has an effect on, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it can have an effect on the children, which is the point that you just raised where if you're away, way a lot, Doug, you know what I mean? Like at what point uh, are they, first of all, do they resent you? When you come back, Doug, you, like you're the leader of the set, then you go and tell your 14 year old that he can't, sit on the couch like that i mean he's gonna go and tell you to you know oh, jump in the lake right yeah exactly <laughs> like i mean he and so and then you as the first ad goes oh, don't tell me to fuck off like just go and sit like and say so suddenly you're butting heads right i mean i'm assuming so yeah no you're you're absolutely right and you know the thing that's made my particular situation work is that my wife is the boss of the house and what happens yeah. is and for many years, if I get to a point where four, five, six weeks I've been home, she's like, oh, when are you going back to work? You're messing up the whole system. You can't come in here mm -hmm. and do that or do the other. She's like, there's a system that works. You got to fall into the system. Don't, and then I learned that very early. And I'm like, okay, how's it working? Well, what's, what, what kid needs a ride? Who gets picked up when? You just tell me and I'll you do it. You become the assistant. Exactly. I am. And then, yeah. I, you know, and then it would, the hard part for me was when I was, cause I moved out to, um, I live in, in, in Pennsylvania, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, between New York and Philly. So I left New York when my son was one 
and we decided that a 450 square foot apartment was no place to raise a child. Um, and, but I would still do a lot of movies in New York. So, but I would essentially stay in New York during the week and come home. And I'm sure you've all experienced this. If you don't see your significant other or your children for five days and you come home, then you're playing power parent for 30 hours. This is what Rachel was alluding to before. You've got no downtime. And then you're going back into the cycle, you know? So I lived that ragged life when they were little. And it's, you know, been the last seven, eight years as they've gotten bigger that I'm traveling more and more around the world. But I pretty much, and you're absolutely right. You got to, you know, and I think that's where the destruction of the family fabric comes into play is that if we don't understand how to put the puzzle together with our significant yeah. others, right? How every puzzle is going to be a little bit different, but how do we play that rather than trying to force the pieces? Natasha, is your partner in the industry? Uh, he's an actor, but he has other jobs because he does not act right. all the time. So it's like 50, 50, 50. 50% human being, 50% uh, film industry preacher. <laughs> um, yeah, but for me- So like, how, do you, how do you guys deal with that? Because the thing yeah. is that, like you, you said before, that you didn't necessarily take jobs away because of your partner. Yeah, so, well, not, not a, this is like my current partner, not some of them were, you know, for previous partners, but yeah, like, you know, after, you know, two big relationships, uh, one official divorce, when I got into the ASC, I was like, wow, I only have one divorce. Like, am I allowed to be here? <laughs> you know? but, um, yeah, I think, you know, with life, you, then you, you start to learn. And, and, and yes, it's like the industry makes it very difficult. But you also start to learn, you know, what's your part in it and, and what you can do to, to give it a better chance. And, and so, you know, I, I think in the last five years or so, I, 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 I really gave a lot of importance to that balance. And, and sometimes, mm. you know, a great movie opportunity was coming at the same time as the beginning of a relationship. And I knew that if I take the movie and, you know, go to Toronto for relationship. five months, yeah, I'm not going to have this relationship. And I just, you know, decided to, to go for the relationship. And, and, and sometimes you have to do that. If, I mean, if you want that, and sometimes you, you will do it for your career. And that's, that's the juggling game, you know, that we have all the time. Yeah. What I found now, nowadays, as, you know, as, as uh, not having kids, uh, my challenge when I come back home and I'm with my partner is to not just be physically, but like be able to like be present as well and not have my head still thinking about the job, thinking about shots, because that's also you know, you can be there, but not really be there. And I think that's where, you yeah. know, the, the disconnection starts and and it kind of, you know, takes a bit toll in the relationship. So it's really, you know, it's really how to be present and how to that switch and how to create boundaries, you know, with the work, um, which is might not have to be with anyone external, you know, but but with your own boundaries. Of like when, you know, when, when do you shut, that down so that you can be present in those two hours that you have with your partner and I think it's I, I think it's something that we all learn through time and we obviously get better the older we get and, and you know the, 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 the more uh, relationships we had and I've had the opportunity to to learn you know through them I, I sometimes wonder whether or not it's better that your partner because right, your partner's not in the film business, right? Not anymore. You know, she was she dabbled in it at, at earlier in her career, and it kind of wasn't right. for her. Um, so yeah, it's, oh, that's good. I think that's better. My my partner used to be a costume designer. That's where I met her on on a on a set. She was the costume designer, and she quite smartly decided to uh, get out of it very early, which I thought maybe I think helped us because if you then suddenly have two people trying to do what we do and navigate those times away that could be a disaster i imagine it could be a disaster i mean it's i i just think there's no there's no easy answer there's no perfect solution like you know in, in our case my wife has taken time off to help with the kids so that we can travel as a unit and stay as a family and all of these things you know but it means the full weight of the financial responsibility falls on me it means, you know, she, there are ways in which she's probably been stifled, you know, from a career perspective and, you know, her whole life becomes family. And then that almost puts extra pressure on you. 
And then you look at, you know, other couples who are both in the, in the industry. I mean, I, I think of two DPs who are both very successful and it's the constant juggle of, you know, I, I'll do a feature, you do commercials, you do a feature, I do commercials, but yeah. you're both making income. So you can, you know, get a nanny or whatever to help, you know, and, and the answer is like, there's, it's, it's all sort of win, win, lose, lose. Like there is no, nobody has yeah. it fully figured out, you know, on good days, I feel like I get to have my cake and eat it too. And on bad days, I feel like I'm, you know, failing at both because yeah. I don't have enough hours in the day, you know? Um, and I think that's, that's just the reality in the same way that by choosing the film industry, we all have sort of assumed a life of uncertainty and, and have to get off a little bit on it. Like the, the yep. not knowing what the next job is going to be not knowing what the next phone call is going to be like that. A lot of people don't have the constitution for that, you know, where I don't have a constitution for, for an office job. Like I just, that would be a disaster for me. Um, don't you I, think part, yeah. don't you think part of our responsibility too is to our crew as well? I mean, this goes back to the hours of the day, right? Because we get time with our family, but so does our crew. And, you know, it, obviously if our crew are away from their families as well, or they're in their home city, that you're, you're, you're nourishing your crew's relationship with their family, which in theory, which in make them better, happy, yeah. better for you. Like you're happy for them. Like that's the, that's the, the, the balance you know, that I'm, I'm loving about shooting in London right now mm. is my English crew get to be at home, which is very rewarding for me seeing that. Yeah, I mean, I also think this is sort of a, a little bit of a tangent, but I feel like, you know, film sets have become so exclusive and you need badges to get past the gates and the this and the that. And it's like, and it's so hard for people to visit each other on set. And it's like, we wield a certain amount of power as DPs that like, you know, I've, usually manage to finagle my family onto set, but how amazing would it be if your key grip could bring their three-year-old to come see what they do, you know? And it's like, I yeah. think like that's something, I mean, it's so silly comparative to the bigger picture, but like I did a commercial right after I gave birth to Cleo where they asked me to do the job like two weeks later. And I said, I would do it as long as I could bring, I was still nursing. She was still sleeping all the time. And I, you know, I was like, can I bring her on the, tech scout, the pre-light and lunch on the shoot day. And they ultimately said, you know, as long as I signed a waiver releasing them of liability, if anything happened to her on the set, that that would be okay. And I was like, great. I would sign that waiver any day of the week. And I, you know, and like, I just think that would be an amazing way to kind of, also, it's just a reminder that there's life outside. Like, I think if anything, I hope we all take from COVID this like general all encompassing sense of life outside of the film world. But like, yeah. why not bring a little more of that to set? You know, like how it gives you a little dose of perspective and there's always time. Totally. We had a lot of that on Dune. We had a lot of that on Dune, a lot of family visiting. That's it was so lovely. Nice. Yeah. Our key, you know, our key grip who was homeschooling his family, had his family there all the time. It was, it was actually a very nice family, homely experience. It didn't feel corporatized or secretive or liable, libelous, you know, just, that there are kids around. I mean, kid, anytime there's a kid around, like it's like having a puppy. You can't yeah. be unhappy if, if there's like a yeah. puppy on set. It's like infusing, you heart, oh. yeah. infusing everyone with a dose of happy pills. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. And even, you know, I'm sure for, for Natasha, like for partners too, it's like so that they don't feel so shut out and excluded from the process, you know? Um, yeah. I think, I think just being able to allow your, your home life a little more into your career life I think would be really fulfilling for on both ends of things I mean I don't know maybe it's a pipe dream but well it's it your home family great. and your film family isn't it yeah exactly it'd also be great to have crashes because what about all the single parents you know who had the kids like yeah. that week right yeah, yeah. You had to like hire somebody to stay at home with the kids where you could just have a crash especially in the studio system a cra wait what are you saying what's the word a, cra yeah, a, crash, a crash a crash a crash like a you know like a kind of kindergarten i've never heard of a crash but i love it yeah but like, you're basically saying like a, a daycare on set is that what yeah. you're saying daycare. yes yeah, yeah. yes hell yeah i've been that's something i've been advocating for for a while too and it's like this is i think that the micro school thing that's happening as a result of covid where you know, people are taking kids of mixed ages and finding ways, al alternative learning and all of these things. I know Bradford was like, I'm never sending my kids back to the typical education system again. But like, 
if we get anything else from this, it's that you could totally do this. You could get a trailer and have everybody, yep. you know, even if the kids aren't exactly the same age and you go in together on one or two, you know, teachers and you teach a mixed age class for the kids who are on the set of Dune or the kids, then I could yep. do Dune, then I could do Blade Runner, you know, like right yep. now yep. as a mom of young children, I can't do the nine month project and it, it kills me. Those are the best, yeah. you know, the best yeah. projects. But like, if yep. we could figure that out, that would be amazing. But I, but I think you're right. That is the way to do it. It's to keep, chime in, hire a teacher wherever you are and homeschool them you know like it's i think Warner brothers in london i think is starting up daycare for, for that exact exact reason i don't know if it's an educational thing or well i know a dp in, in you need a second unit dp because yeah <laughs> I, I, there's a there's a dp in la um i've forgotten his name but i think he travels with his family to set every day in a in a, in a rv and they drive the rv they park it behind the camera truck and the kids are all homeschooled now who the homeschooled by is, is the debate because I must say homeschooling, I would prefer my wisdom teeth get pulled out, put back in and then pulled out again than homeschool. So I would never ask my wife to homeschool my kids if I could avoid it or myself. But yes, if you could hire someone who's skilled and trained at teaching. Yeah. Um, Cause it's such a special, I mean, it's one thing COVID's taught me is that we, we don't pay our teachers enough, but sure. like, that you then hire a teacher. I mean, it's a fantastic well, I, idea. I think the model of getting them with other kids, I mean, I've heard about the, I, I know yeah. who you're talking about. I think I worked with them. I don't remember their names, but the second unit DP who takes the kids with, but it's like, they're not getting to interact with other kids. Um, and that's, you know, yeah. one of the reasons I haven't wanted to uproot my kids at this point or do something like that is they're so social. They like, you know, they, they, feed off of other people just like we do and so yep. I think you know a version where it's a, more of a mobile daycare and they can be with other kids besides you know the mom or the nanny or the family would, would for me anyway be preferable yeah well I mean these are the times now right that this is what everyone's talking about like these things that we're learning and experiencing and thinking about like coming out in in this change of how we're going back to business to start to collectively talk about these things and you know, potentially institute some changes. I mean, this is this is what this is all about. And these are what a lot of these conversations we've been having are about is like, what do we want to see change? How can we, you know, and we talk about the balance of work life, but we could make the work life balance so much better if we're able to transition some of that life to set as we're talking about now, you know, uh, not just for ourselves, but as department heads, we speak for a lot of people under us that we could help lead the charge. You know, and this is the thing. It only takes a handful of the people with the power on set, the producer, you know, the DP, the AD, the director to say like, okay, let's do it like this. And then you know what happens? It's done like that, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's really about having these conversations more now is making people understand within the industry that these are real thoughts and concerns that we're all having as vital people to this industry about how to make our loved ones, you know, make, make ourselves better artists and workers by having our loved ones be part of our process sometimes. Yeah, sure. agreed. You know, this is something that we've gone over th through this with Bradford, as you said before, Bradford, I've had several discussions with him about it and he's very, you know, he's advocating a big social change in terms of, you know, how we run the idea of, uh, of creating the set environment and, you know, and, and people being able to interact with their families um, not just at home, but, and this is something that we've all learned in this downtime. Like we're talking about the idea of like, what have we all learned or experienced that we never experienced before? And I think what yeah. we're, we're all drinking from the cup that we are, know how to be better people in general, if we and, and, and more fulfilled human beings, if we have this different aspect of our relationships and our families around us. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right though. If it, it, it takes people to go, well, this is the way we want to do it. So, you know, I say that, Tasha says that, says that, Rachel, like everyone says, this is the way we want to do it. And yeah. this is what we want to do. It will take a little bit of organization because it means that whatever show you're on, if you're trying to homeschool, again, you you should try and gr group some kids together from the crew that are approximately the same ages. 
Um, but this is a great time to to induce that because it would be the most COVID safe option, actually. You know that everyone well, would be in one community, and this all these kids that you're going, everyone is going back to every day. Like they're all yeah. together, they're not going and seeing other kids, and it's actually a great moment to yeah. make it happen yeah. and then just keep it. Yeah, I mean, I think the, that the problem. Gonna, sorry. Well, no, the the problem though, you're right though. But to, if you wanted to do that at a studio then suddenly there's a whole liability issue with studios. And so, but yeah, you're off, off site. It's a great time. But, but that's what we're dealing with, even with the COVID of it all, right. Is like the waiver. Well, you know, like it's, it's all about liability. Yeah. That's all they think about is, is liability. And it's like, okay, so then come up with some crazy form where we sign every possible liability waiver that you need, you know, for the assurance that like, I would do that in a heartbeat like in a heartbeat, if it meant that my kids could be on set or, or could, you know, I think most people would. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, this is, let's, let's figure it. Somebody who's, who's got the legal jargon figured out, draft something up. Let's, let's pitch it. Figure it out. Yeah. That's always the case, isn't it? Um, uh, I mean, I guess in terms of, you know, just, and, uh, you know, a lot of, the, it's interesting because a lot of the questions that have been coming in is about, particularly asking, you know, especially you, Rachel, in terms of, you know, we often get these questions, the same thing happened when we had read on about people always curious about how you're able to navigate being a mother and being a DP, you know, which, you know, you've gleaned on a lot. So, you know, you know, but just to let you know, that's kind of like a lot of what people always seem to be curious about, especially, you know, as we're getting this business for the rightfully so now is finally we're getting to this position where we're getting more inclusive about women's roles in our industry which should have been something that was happened a long time ago and as it's happening more now there's a lot of younger people trying to understand you know it's that difficult thing do how and when do you ever make the decision oh family or career you know and i mean so so reed and i would say the same thing which is there's never a good time you can't plan these things you know, like I, my attempt at planning landed me with my first child right in the middle of the Creed shoot, like, which would have been like more people saw that movie in one weekend than had seen everything I've done to date to that time. And literally like Ryan called me to tell me we were shooting from January to March. And I think I went silent and he was like, sis, don't say it. He's like, you're pregnant. I was due in February and that, that was an attempt to plan. You know what I mean? Like it just, it doesn't work. And I think, I think it just comes down to, it has to be worth it to you, but if it is, you know, it's so incredibly fulfilling that there will be sacrifices. I mean, the movies that I wasn't able to shoot with my second or just as, you know, like you always think about, you know, the sacrifices, but they're, but they're incredibly worth it, you know? And it's like, yeah. um, I think that that figuring out ways to bring family to set will be really helpful. And I hope that in the next, you know, the next decade that that changes. Um, and I think, you know, people recognizing that we can shoot pregnant will be helpful. And it's, you know, that's not for everybody, but, it, you know, for me, it was, I had a very easy pregnancy. Um, and then, you know, quite honestly, I think in the more heteronormative version, men stepping up and, and doing more of the heavy lifting at home will help a lot of women have the careers they want. You know, I think there's as much of a, as much as I would be judged for, you know, in society, as much as I'd be judged for, for leaving and doing nine months on the road away from my kid or, or leaving my three month old at home while I shot Dear Zero Dark 30, which God knows, mm -hmm. you know, that, that movie would be worth it. But like, fuck, as much as yeah. that's a double standard for me, conversely, you know, I know women whose husbands are stay-at-home dads and they get, they, they, they're made to feel emasculated by society, by, you know, and it's like, we have to get to a place where men can step it up and not feel any kind of shame for doing so, you know, and, and not be made to feel yeah. shame for doing so. Like it has to, isn't it, it, roles need to even out. Isn't it ridiculous though that that still exists? Like we're 2020 and yeah. like the people that make these decisions are people like us in theory. So we are society. So the thing is that you go, well, how does that work? Because we don't feel like that. So how does society, if it's made up by people like us, feel like that? It's some ingrained, ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it starts. Fly back to the park. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, my, it does my, start early. My, my son has long hair and I still have my, you know, my aunt, like, who's my closest living relative, you know, asking me when I'm going to give him a haircut. 
you know, like it's, it's uh, it, I mean, that's, I mean, it, and she's amazing, but it's like, it's so ingrained and, and it'll, it's, I mean, that'll change little by little, but. No, it, it's really funny though, because you're, you're right. I don't know why it's ingrained. I don't know how it's ingrained, but I remember my, one of my kids said something to my wife about the fact that I earn the money, that she doesn't earn the money. And my wife went, I beg your pardon. Do you want to see the, like, do you want to do you look at our accounts? Like, right. and then she told me about it. And I was like mortified that one of our children would make an association with me over money rather, rather than my wife. Now, my wife, probably because she spends more time at home working in her office and locked and, you know, like, but, but she's more present than I am. Perhaps it's that. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm more working away from home. But the fact that one of my male children, I don't know, it doesn't matter if it was male or female, but I don't know if it was male, but they assume that she made less money. I made more money than my wife. Like yeah, I, it's, I, it's, it, it would insane, insane as, as assumption based on no real fact. Yeah, it's real. I mean, we're making strides and we're doing it exponentially, but it's, you know, we have a law, a long way to go. I mean, you, yeah. know, you look at this country and you're like, fuck. We've a, we a much longer way to go than I think any of us even realized, you know, on every level. Um, but sorry, Doug, just to go back to your question, there's there's never a good time, so you just have to go for it. You have to stay true to yourself. And, you know, kids aside, like relationships, same thing, to, to Natasha's point. I mean, I can't tell you how many failed relationships I had because of this career before I even got into the family of it all. You know, it's like you have to find the balance that feels where you feel like you're getting your needs met on both ends but at the same time you're gonna you know also feel like a failure all the time and you know like those need there's just not enough hours in the day the answer is that even even for those of us who manage to kind of find a balance there is no real balance no that's the good that's a great way of putting it and they're just and it's like that with anything in life right there's never you know you can say oh you know buying a house or doing there's never a right time it's just like you, things things get done or they, they happen you know or, or they don't happen or you just force them to happen you know it's just it, it, it's that simple the, the planning of it all as you so aptly said you know having giving birth to a child were you actually in the shoot when when the child was due or so so cleo it's my grips we're joking we're i, I did a shoot on my doctor said i was never going to make it i did a shoot on a sunday mm -hmm. night and she was due on tuesday and um oh no it wasn't that she was due on tuesday i was four centimeters dilated and he was like, you're not going to make it through the weekend. And so Edu Grau was kind enough. He had just had his baby. So he was sort of already at home. He was kind enough to, to you know, be my backup in case something happened. And literally I called him up. I was like, you might want to keep your phone on. Like this is, because I thought it was, she wasn't due for another two weeks. So I thought that I had some time. And then I, like, I went in on a Friday and I was dilated. But we were shooting in a, a water tank. So my grips were like, worst comes to worst. We'll just throw you in and you can have a water birth. Birth. And then I gave birth 36 hours later. Oh my God. It's yeah. yeah. There, there's no, it's, it's very primal though. Right. It's very primal because yeah. your body, body, your body and your spirit went, I got to do that. And yeah. then I can do that. And then I'm done. Totally. Yeah. It's amazing. And your body does know, I mean, the same way you get sick after a shoot, you will hold out for, you know, four months and like 20, totally. 24 hours after you call rap, you're like in bed, you know, your body knows in a weird way. Well, that was like yeah. exactly Natasha was referencing that in terms of in the beginning of going into the lockdown and, and she's absolutely right. It's like, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know, and that's why as we all feel like for some reason in this, in this group expanded breath of, of not working collectively together, how the idea of, you know, you know, Greg, you said your situation was very hurried and stressed in a lot of ways, but I think there is a, a common thread of people who are able to really take a deep breath in this time and really, fully charged the battery to a certain extent, yep. you know, like that hadn't really been done before to really fill the tank up, you know, and, and it's interesting in terms of, you know, because as, as we were saying, it's like in certain ways, we are somewhat like Olympic athletes, right? It's like when you have your downtime and you're not working, you get back, you're not in the shape. It takes a little bit of while to get back in filmmaking shape. There is such a thing which requires not only mental, but physical stamina, right? That, when you take some time off, you know, you've got to get back into that shape, you know? So, you know, I mean, these are all parts of what, you know, when we talk about life balance and coming back now to work, it's like, you know, how we're all kind of just flexing our wings 
together as a filmmaking group and almost like taking these first steps again as a group, like getting out there and, and, and starting it, you know? And um, uh, just cu curious, Natasha, did you say that you are in, are you going back to prep very soon? Yeah, we started this week. You started this week already. Okay. All right. So, and, and, and staying in Los Angeles, the projects in Los Angeles. Yes. Okay. yes we have like, Two weeks in Palm Springs, the first two weeks in Palm Springs, where I think it's we're going to- the Holy Grail, Natasha. Yeah, quite quarantine. Mm -hmm. And then- You've had a couple, you've had a couple in LA, or, had, or you've chosen films in LA. Well, right? that's the thing, like I've chosen, the last three ones were in LA, and, and it had a lot to do with personal life, you know, just feeling that I, 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 I couldn't deal with, like, you know, being by myself, like five months somewhere else, and, and I wanted to nurture my relationship, and and stay here so you know but I think it's really important you know when we're talking about balance of life and work it sounds like like balance is like oh you find the magic formula to have them both and I think the the reality of the world of the word balance in this case is that in some moments you choose over the other one so you, you you're not having everything you're not having the cake and eating it it's just like when do you sacrifice work in order to protect family and when you sacrifice family in order to protect work and every situation is different and it's on a day-to-day -day basis. And they make you appreciate the other one. And they also, I mean, the balance I think comes from the way that they offset each other. Like, you know, when my movie shut down, I was gutted, gutted, you know, obviously beyond, I mean, there's the health and COVID of, of everything, but also just, you know, I put so much myself into it. But then if I look back at the past three or four months, like in, in this time, my son has learned to read, my son has learned to ride a bike, and my son has learned to swim. And I was there for all of it. I was in for yeah. the world. And like, yeah. and I think about, you know, so it's like they, you balance each other in the in the same way, like highs that make you appreciate lows and lows make you appreciate highs. Like they offset one another. They give you perspective, you know, I'm sure yeah. like when you lose a film that you really wanted to do and but then you gain a you know trip away with your boyfriend like things happen for reasons in weird ways too you know you have to take yeah. some solace in that i it's it was very uh, rewarding for me i taught my children how to unload a dishwasher nice as ridiculous as ridiculous as it sounds to you know young males who hadn't really done that before because there hadn't been a a uh a priority for them and now like the best kitchen cleaners i've ever seen so Same. that was my Same contribution my well my wife taught them how to read and do maths and and speak properly i taught them how to clean the kitchen so i'm that was my limit of my addition are you teaching them to empty the trash and put a new bag because that's going to be very useful yes to yes have in the future yes 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 all that things. I want them to be a, 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 a good man about the house. I don't want them to be a, a useless, uh, useless male. You are preparing them well, Mr. Frazier. And, and, and as you yeah. said, there will be some people in their future that will be very happy that you did that. Yeah. That's right. And I'm waiting for whoever that, those people might be to, to pat me on the back. To, <laughs> thanks for teaching them to clean the kitchen, to cook, to empty the bins. Um, well, listen, Everyone, I think this has been an amazing discussion and it's a discussion that, you know, it, it's really interesting because we started the film round table, as I said before, our very first kickoff was about and locked and everyone was still in lockdown. So it was very different, but this is a conversation that's going to keep on going is the idea of the work balance, right? It's like, and I think it's, and, and we've touched upon it here, what we can take out of this to help our, ourselves, our peers, and people that work on in, 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 in the ladder below us on the film community to have a better existence, right? To have a better personal existence. And, and this has been very valuable for us to discuss on an open forum. And I really appreciate all three of you coming in and sharing your expertise and your personal stories with us because, you know, this is the type of stuff that also makes, you know, young filmmakers out there realize wow, they're all just real people too with real problems. That gives me a shot because I used to think, you know, people in, live in bubbles where they get so overwhelmed by their own personal problems and don't realize that we as people that have, you know, moved into a, a, some level of success, we suffer from all of those problems.
problems as well and all of those fears and all of those insecurities, you know? So it's been great that you guys can come here and share your expertise with all of us about this. I really appreciate it. And I thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, and Thank you, man. And, thank and, you. Uh, and this has been great. And I just wanna let everyone know a couple of things. One, I also always want to give a thank out to the whole, the group that is the film Roundtable, which is Matthew Wolf has been, was very uh, helpful in helping organize and getting all of you together with your time. Aaron Weil and Maria Prieto, without them and uh, the four of us do everything we can to get people to come together and, and talk to the community. So I want to give a thank Great out job. to them because they're not here for this. And I also want to just give a quick plug for next week on uh, Wednesday the 19th. Uh, we've got a very eclectic group that starts with writer-director Terrence Nance. Uh, we've got artist Jen Nikaru, Martine Sims, uh, director Jen Nikaru, artist Martine Sims, and we've got, it's going to be moderated by producer Tamir Muhammad. So that's going to be a very eclectic group oh. that in there is talking about their holistic approach to life art and their idea of well-being in their art. So that's gonna be an interesting one as well um, in many of the topics that we have here that's, uh, you know, that's gonna stick within the theme of we're talking about everyone's well-being. So I wanna thank you all for coming. I wanna thank everyone who tuned in and there's been a lot of appreciation for everything you guys have been able to tell us. Um, and thank you so much for your time. And listen, good luck, Rachel. Thanks, I know guys. you're gonna start your, and Greg, you're, over in London and Natasha in Los Angeles. So, you know, we're all getting back to it safely. Good luck, everybody. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, yeah. Rach. Thanks, Thank Natasha. Thank Thank Good luck with the Batman, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Bye, guys. Enjoy. Bye. Bye-bye.